Good morning, everybody. Uh, you can do better than that. Good morning, everybody. Good morning, teacher. <laughs> you can probably tell I'm in a good mood today. I don't know why. I got a good night's sleep. Um, I slept. I slept in and then uh, came to church early. I was telling folks and um, just had a peaceful morning. I sat outside, enjoyed creation. It's just been a great day. So uh, I'm looking forward to a, a wonderful worship as well. Before we begin our worship service, though, let me get to a couple of announcements here. In the bulletin, you'll see the mask requirement in all buildings. Uh, you're all familiar with that, and I appreciate your compliance in that. Uh, staff appreciation, we'll be collecting for staff appreciation through the end of October. So uh, please indicate in the memo line or on the envelope that is for staff appreciation. Project planning group meeting on Tuesday. Uh, this is a work group that the church council had uh, put together. And um, basically we're, we're looking at what, you know, the vision of the church. Where are we going? Who are we? And what are we supposed to be doing? Uh, and so the first meeting of that group will be this Tuesday, October 5th at 4.30. All members are invited to attend, and those of you who are on that group, uh, you all should have the Present Future book. Hopefully you all have read it. Uh, if not, you've got till 4.30 on Tuesday to read that book, because that's what we'll be discussing. Uh, cornhole players needed October 10th. So we have uh, started this idea of what we're calling the community missionary, where there are folks who are uh, who have chosen to be missionaries to different places and uh, Penny Brown and Priscilla Morris are the missionaries to Williams Place and so they have scheduled a cornhole tournament next Saturday I guess it is and are looking for players so if anyone would like to play cornhole next Sunday excuse me next Sunday after church my apologies next Sunday after church at two o'clock uh, so uh, if you have any interest in that please contact Penny Brown and I'll tell you, those people up at uh, Williams Place, they are wicked cornhole players. Uh, be ready to be humbled if you go play against them. But anyhow. All right. Chili Cook-Off, October 27th. That's in the bulletin there. And uh, there's a insert, or not an insert, but a, a little sheet at the uh, table where the uh, collection plate is. So if you would like to register to be a chili king or queen, potentially, fill that out and drop that in the collection plate. Excellent, excellent, like that. Uh, and then the last thing at the bottom for missions, uh, please bring an empty shoe box for the upcoming Samaritan's Purse. You know, the, the, the fill the shoe box and then they get shipped off. So if you have a shoe box, please just bring them next week uh, over the next couple of weeks and we'll be collecting those for that mission. Uh, also in the bulletin is an insert about deacon nominations. So glad, I guess it's Denise who did this, get started early on that. Um, in the church, we'd nominate deacons, and so nominated by the congregation. So if you're a church member and you would like to nominate someone to be a deacon, you can put that down there and um, get that process started, drop that in the collection plate as well. Uh, other than that, our regular announcements, Wednesday morning we have men's prayer breakfast from 7 to 8. Uh, would really love to have some of the men from First Baptist come. Uh, we also have at 2 o'clock Bible study, which is available via Zoom or in person. And then there is 6.30 Bible study, which is uh, available in Zoom or in person. And just to tell you, the, the 2 o'clock Bible study, we do something we call review and preview. We review the sermon from this week, and then we preview the sermon for next week. So it actually helps y'all to understand what's going on. If you have questions from today, you can ask them on Wednesday, and then you get a little preview of what's coming up next week so you can be better prepared. So anyone and everyone is invited to that. We meet uh, in person in the library generally or online through the Zoom, so whichever works for you. 6.30 Bible study. Uh, this month of October, uh, we're going to be doing all the spooky, scary things in the Bible. So uh, we're starting out this Wednesday with witches, right? With uh, witches and the witch trials and all that. So that'll be the topic this Wednesday night. And uh, if that's of interest to you, you can join us in person in the fellowship hall or via Zoom. And uh, after that, no choir practice at this time. Um, and other than that, I think that's all the announcements, unless we have any others.
Seeing none, Terry, can you lead us in worship, please? It'll once again be my honor. In the book of John, starting in the 34th verse, the Bible says, My food, says Jesus, is to do the will of him who sent me and to finish his work. Don't you have a saying? It's still four months until the harvest. I tell you, open your eyes and look at the fields. They are ripe for harvest. Our call to worship this morning is hymn number 445. It's called People Need the Lord. The words will be on the screen or open your hymn book to page 445 and sing with us. Let's stand as we sing. All God's children said, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you, Terry. All right, then now it's time for our <clears throat> praises and prayer requests. I'm going to start out the praise with just what a beautiful day it is today the Lord has given to us. And so thank you, the Lord, for that. A uh, couple of praises. I want to praise uh, the uh, uh, particularly Omar and Diana. So this past Tuesday night, we had the Cornelius Candidates Forum in the Fellowship Hall, and um, Diana and Omar, Omar's from the Revive Iglesia Cristiana, he runs their AV, but they worked tirelessly for at least two days trying to get the equipment set up in the Fellowship Hall, and when it was all over, they had nine microphones running at the same time, uh, and a video camera and everything over there so we could stream it out live, uh, but anyway, so thank you so much for all that effort you guys put in. Appreciate that. <clears throat> Thank you. And then Jim and Jean, Jim uh, Miles and Jean McKinney showed up to help uh, volunteer. So I appreciate whenever folks volunteer. Thank you as, for that as well. So praise God for that. <clears throat> yeah. So, uh, yeah. So we have, and that's, I'm glad you brought that up. So there's, uh, we got the phones transferred over from the parsonage to the new office, from the old office to the new. When they did that, they also transferred the internet line. Uh, which actually cut the internet that was over here. Thank God for Mike Sharp, who ran a, a line all the way over from the education building over to here, which is what we're running on right now. Uh, so, uh, yes, they did get the phones moved over. The, if you're in the fellowship hall and you need the Wi-Fi, there's a new password and all, which I'll post up there. But uh, if you go into the, in the fellowship hall and you find out the Wi-Fi doesn't work, it's because the password changed with the new system. Thank you for reminding me of that. Okay. <clears throat> all right, coming back, but praise, praise, praise all those uh, workers here. Um, moving on to prayers, I've got Bob Lavin passed away. He was a neighbor of the McKinney's. Remember that family? Uh, I'll come back to that. Uh, we've got Tim Alexander. We continue to remember Tim. Uh, Ronnie Brown, actually, a praise, actually. He's home and he's recovering. Uh, and I'm going to add Pastor Carlos to that. He's a praise and a prayer request. So Pastor Carlos from Revive Iglesia Cristiana, as you all know, had COVID, was in the hospital for about two months. Uh, I spoke to his, his daughter this morning. Now, he's home, but he really uh, took it hard. He lost 50 pounds, she said. Now, he wasn't a big guy to start with, and so um, he is very thin, very weak. He couldn't walk when he got out of the hospital. He is now walking, uh, so please continue to pray for Pastor Carlos' uh, continuing uh, recovery. Uh, <clears throat> Shelly uh, DeWeese, uh, we have her on a prayer list for anxiety. Uh, I've got another uh, praise, which is Frances Hudson. She's out of rehab, uh, so that's a praise. Uh, Farrell Lemmings, who is the pastor at Grace Covenant Church, has COVID. So uh, remember him, uh, please. And then Fred Wanky, uh, still struggling with his cancer. So keep uh, Fred in your 
prayers. Uh, we also have a couple of birthdays uh, coming up. Terry's birthday on Wednesday. Happy birthday. Uh, Claudia Perry, who's not here. Uh, and it would have been Henry Pender's birthday on, on Wednesday as well. So you might want to remember Dot on Wednesday uh, and, and call her or something like that. Other than that, we always pray for the church, not only our church, but uh, Revive Iglesia Cristiana, which meets here, as well as the Kachin Baptist Church. Uh, the church worldwide and all persecuted Christians. Pray for our government and our leaders, the country, our military, our first responders, and, um, and all those who are doing the work of our Lord and Savior. Any additional prayers to add before we... There you go, Priscilla Mars. Okay, so Patricia, Patricia, Patricia Till, I can't, <laughs> excuse me, we'll remember her. Okay, all right. Yes, Kathy. Yes. Okay, okay, we'll pray for good results. All right, any unspoken prayer requests? I'm sure there's many, so let's take it all to the Lord in prayer. Heavenly Father, we are a blessed people. We're blessed, Lord, because we uh, call you Father. Abba, Father, we come to you, Lord, as little children, knowing that you love us and care for us and have everything uh, that is best for us. And so, Lord God and Father, we just uh, lift up these many praises to you first and foremost, always praising your name, but also, all these prayer requests, Lord, there's uh, many as well. There's so much to be thankful for, and there's so much to prepare to be thankful for, because we know, Lord, that you hear these prayers and that you will respond to them in the right way. And so, Lord, as you respond to these prayer requests, as we uh, may not understand your response each and every time, we just pray that we would align our will with yours, your will be done. And so, Lord God and Father, I, I thank you once again for this wonderful church and these wonderful people and all the blessings that you've been pouring out upon us each and every year from the inception of this church until today and for 117 years into the future, Lord, we just praise your name. In Jesus, I pray. Amen. And uh, we don't pass the plate anymore, as you know, but we continue to leave the collection plate on the back table. For those of you who'd like to drop your tithes and offering in the plate on the way in or way out, we thank you for that. For those of you who are at home watching on Facebook Live, if you would uh, continue to support the missions of this church, you can send in your tithes and offerings to First Baptist Church of Cornelius, P.O. Box 100, Cornelius, North Carolina, 28031, or go to the website and use the donate page. Either way, we thank you all for your generosity, and we thank you at home as well for the continued support of this church. Terry? In the book of Psalms, chapter 119, the Bible says, Open my eyes that I may see wonderful things in your law. Let's stand as we sing, Open my eyes that I may see. It's hymn number 573 in your hymn book, or the words will be on the screen.
Now let's go to the Lord once again in prayer and thank him for all the many tithes and offerings that were brought into his churches around the world today. Oh, my most kind and gracious Heavenly Father, what an honor it is to speak to you, to pause and just enjoy the embrace of your holy arms around my soul, around my body, around my spirit. You are so good to us, Lord. Like David said, we are a blessed people. Blessed to be able to call you our most kind and gracious Heavenly Father. We do thank you for the, the services that are being held all around the world today to honor you, Lord. May what we do in these services be sweet music to your ears. And a blessing to all the others that hear it. That participate in your services, Lord. That hear your message proclaimed. Help those messages to make a difference, Lord. Help those messages to open our eyes that we may see. To open our ears that we may hear. To open our hearts that we may serve the way you'd have us to serve. Heavenly Father, we do thank you for the tithes and offerings that were brought into your churches around the world today. We pray that you'll undergird them, Lord. That you'll break our hearts for what breaks yours. And that you'll guide us to spend these treasures the way you'd have them spent, Lord. Help us all to treasure life, Lord. Help us all to cherish it and preserve it preserve it at every opportunity help us always to do your will help us to share your gospel lord for the fields are ripe for harvest but the workers are few help us lord to do your will help us to spend more time with you help us to get to know you better every day for knowing you better makes us better Christians, Lord. Forgive us for our many sins and shortcomings. Help us to truly walk more Christ-like each day. For it's in the beautiful, powerful name of your Son, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Redeemer, we pray. Amen. I'm going to sing a song for you today, I'll try to, called Empty Handed. When I first heard that song, I thought about all the physical needs out there that aren't being met. The people living on the streets, the people that are lonely and wondering without you. But you know, people can be living on the streets in other ways too. They can have everything that they need in this world, just like most of us do. But if we're living without our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, we're kind of living on the streets without salvation, without His love, without Him to be able to call our Lord and Savior. So as I sing... Think about the physical needs that need to be met. But think about the spiritual needs that need to be met also. Even for those that don't have physical needs. They need the Lord. They need the Lord. Myself ready for the long day ahead. Instead of being thankful for the job that I have, I just wish that I could get back in bed. There are people everywhere living on the street.
Thank you. Praise the Lord. Now as Char continues to beautifully play, let's prepare our hearts and minds, our very souls, to receive God's message for us today. All right, <clears throat> excuse me. Our scripture reading today is from the Gospel according to Matthew, verses 35 through 38. If you are able, please stand for the reading of God's Word. <clears throat> and again, this is Matthew chapter 9, beginning at verse 35. Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dejected, like sheep without a shepherd. Then he said to his disciples, The harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Therefore, pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into his harvest. And all God's people said, Amen. You may be seated. <clears throat> In 1813, at the age of 25, Adoniram Johnson was the first American missionary to Burma, which is now called Myanmar, where the Kachin people come from. He and his wife Anne married two weeks before they boarded a ship bound for India from which they eventually were able to make their way to Burma, Judson would spend the next nearly 40 years of his life among uh, the Burmese people witnessing to them. Until her death, Anne was the friend of many and even more fluent in the Burmese language than her academically inclined husband. Judson's efforts were slow going. He was imprisoned and tortured, but he never gave up on his God-given calling to reach Burma for Christ. Before his death, Adoniram Johnson had not only established several churches in Burma, but he had also given Burma one of the greatest gifts, the Bible in their own language. Now, I read that brief story about uh, this missionary couple as an encouragement to you, and it plays very well in today's sermon. Because you see, despite the opposition that that couple faced, imprisonment and torture on top of all the slow going, as it said, they continued on in their ministry for nearly 40 years, giving their entire lives, essentially, 
to the witnessing and the proclaiming of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And it's a beautiful thing to see that they went on and did what they did. And it's the lesson for us today that despite opposition to the gospel, we must continue our missionary efforts, driven by compassion for the lost and trusting in God to provide all the resources we will need. And with that, we come to the beginning of our reading here, verse 35. And immediately as I read the Christian Standard Bible version, I just focused on one word. It says, Jesus continued. Jesus continued. That word continued doesn't show up in all of the translations, but it is a great word for them to have included. You see, if you go all the way back to chapter 4, Verse 23, it says, Now Jesus began to go all over Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and sickness. And now we go five chapters ahead, and it says, Jesus continued going around to all the towns and villages, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom, and healing every disease and every sickness. Jesus continued that ministry. He's been working in this ministry in Galilee for the half of the reading so far, all the way back to chapter 4. And he continues on despite the opposition that he has been facing. If you recall from last week, the very last verse we read, verse 34, the Pharisees said he drives out demons by the ruler of demons. Jesus was raising the little girl from the dead, helped the bleeding woman. He was giving sight to the blind and opening the mouths of the mute by casting out the demons, right? Doing all these good things in the name of the Lord. And what happens? He gets criticized for it. He feels opposition from the Pharisees. The religious establishment is turning against him. And it would have been very easy to say, you know what, I'm not going to bother with this. I'm just going to leave Galilee. But he doesn't do that. Jesus continued going around all the towns and villages and teaching and preaching and and so on. The exact same verse is copied from verse uh, 423 over here, essentially to, to 935, to show that it continued in every aspect. It continued in going. There's four verbs here. Jesus continued going. All right, he went. He didn't just stay in one place. One of the things we've been talking about a lot is we've got to get up and go out to where the people are. The Great Commission says, go, therefore, and make disciples. And Jesus does exactly that. He goes to all the towns and villages. And he doesn't stay away from some of them. It says he went to all the towns and villages. It would have been very easy if there was opposition in certain towns to say, you know what, I'm not going to go there. It's just too much trouble. I'll go to the easy ones. No, he goes to them all despite any opposition he might face. It says he was teaching in the synagogues. Where are the religious leaders? They're in the synagogue. Does he say to himself, I'm not going to go to the synagogues because, you know, the Pharisees hang out there and they don't like me. And, you know, I'm just going to avoid the synagogues. But that's where the people were going to learn. And that's where Jesus went to teach. He didn't turn away because he was concerned about the Pharisees opposition. He went right into the place where they were and stood up against them. They were going. He was teaching. He was preaching the good news of the kingdom. During a Wednesday Bible study, when we were previewing this sermon, someone asked me, what's the difference between teaching and preaching? Because they're very similar. There's a key difference. In teaching, it's the transfer of knowledge. The person is giving the knowledge to someone else. But in preaching, in addition to that transfer of knowledge, is a call to action. Right? The preaching demands a response. And so when Jesus is there preaching the good news of the kingdom of God, he's not just transferring knowledge to the people about what the kingdom is. He is calling them to make a decision. Will you follow me or not? And that is essentially the call to action of every sermon. That's why we do the altar call at the end. 
Will you follow me or not? Because there's bad news. We're all going to hell. But there's good news. There's a way to heaven, and it's through Jesus Christ. There's no good news without bad news. And Jesus calls for a response. And then, of course, it says he is healing. He is going, teaching, preaching, and healing every disease and sickness. He's not selective about which ones he's going to heal. He's not unable to heal some. He can do it all. But remember, he is healing the people not as a means, of, not as the end, but as the means to an end. He does the good works to attract the people so that he can share the message. Now, pressing on in spite of opposition just seems to be the way of the Christian life. Never does Jesus promise our road will be easy. As a matter of fact, he promises the opposite, that it's going to be hard. Yet, like Jesus, men and women called by God press on and persevere. Think about the disciples. What if they had quit? Think about the opposition when you read the book of Acts that they, they uh, faced. Beatings and whippings and being thrown out of the synagogue and all the different things that happened to them. And then eventually, they're all martyred with the exception of John. All of them meet their death at the hands of the opposition. It would have been a lot easier just to quit and spare your life. But there was something greater than their own lives that they gave for. And it was the gospel of Jesus Christ. Paul could have quit. The early church could have quit. Think about our own American history. What about the pilgrims? What if the pilgrims quit? Right? 400 and year, uh, 401 years ago today, they are out somewhere in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean. They left Plymouth, England on September 16th, and they don't arrive to the New World until November. So they're out there in the middle of the ocean. After two failed attempts, they had tried twice before, but the Speedwell, the other boat, kept springing leaks. Eventually, now it was September. It was really too late to start that trip. They could have easily said, you know what? Twice didn't work. It's getting too late in the season. Let's wait to another year or whatever. When they get out there the third time, one of the main beams within the ship cracks because of the storms. And they could have turned back as well. There was an argument on the ship. Let's turn back or let's proceed. It would have been easy for the pilgrims to turn back. But they didn't. They had a God-given calling. If you read the, of Plymouth Plantation by William Bradford, it speaks of how this was not just a journey to the, to the United States, or what's now the United States, uh, to the New World um, for entrepreneurial or, or gold or fortune or whatever. They were going because they felt it was God's calling to them. And they didn't turn back on that calling. Some of you may know the name Herm Edwards. He's a formal former NFL football player. He's now uh, the coach of Arizona State. And he has made famous a line for his team, which is, quitting is not an option. And I love that. Quitting is not an option. It sums up the Christian life, in my opinion. If you ever feel like giving up in your Christian walk or service, just remember, quitting is not an option. Just do what Jesus did. Continue on with the mission. Get going and teaching and preaching and healing. And don't stop. Now with that, you might ask, well, what was it that drove Jesus' sense of mission? All right, why would he do it? Well, we get a little insight into at least one thing that drove him, and that is Jesus' compassion for the lost. Turning to verse 36, it says, When he saw the crowds, he felt compassion for them, because they were distressed and dejected like sheep without a shepherd. Jesus felt compassion for the crowds. That word in Greek means all the way down into your gut, all the way down into your bowels, literally, is what it says. We would say today that the people touched his heart. That sounds a little kinder to me. But he felt compassion for them because they were distressed and dejected is the translation I have here. If you look at the different Bible translations, there's lots of different words that are used. 
That first word distressed means they were exhausted to the point of fainting. The King James Version actually says they were fainting. It literally means that they were unloosed or untied like an animal that has gotten loose. All right, think of them as sheep. They're no longer in the sheep pen. The shepherds have been falling down on the job. The gates are wide open and the sheep have just gone loose. They've been gone loose for so long. They don't have food. They don't have water. And they are exhausted from wandering. They're at the point of fainting. The other word dejected, as it's translated here, sometimes says helpless in others. It literally means they were beaten down and thrown to the ground beaten down how were they beaten down well it was because of the pharisees the pharisees were supposed to be the shepherds of israel but they had not done what they should do they were abusing their authority taking advantage of the people they were pouring onto their backs more and more man-made laws and things for the people to follow and it was like a weight on their backs And consequently, the people were beaten down and exhausted to the point of failing. They were sheep without a shepherd, Jesus says. And that takes us back to Ezekiel chapter 34. If you were a Jew in the first century, you would have immediately made the connection to the sheep without a shepherd. We, not knowing our Old Testament well enough, probably don't make that connection immediately. But in Ezekiel 34, beginning at verse 1, it says, The word of the Lord came to me, Son of man, prophesy against the shepherds of Israel. Prophesy and say to them, This is what the Lord God says to the shepherds. Woe to the shepherds of Israel who have been feeding themselves. Shouldn't the shepherds feed their flock? You eat the fat, wear the wool, and butcher the fattened animals, but you do not tend to the flock. You have not strengthened the weak or healed the sick, bandaged the injured, brought back the strays or sought the lost. Instead, you have ruled them with violence and cruelty. They were scattered for lack of a shepherd. They became food for all the wild animals when they were scattered. My flock went astray on all the mountains and on every high hill. My flock was scattered over the whole face of the earth and there was no one searching or seeking for them. Therefore, you shepherds, hear the word of the Lord. As I live, this is the declaration of the Lord God. Because my flock, lacking a shepherd, has become prey and food for every wild animal, and because my shepherds do not search for my flock, and because the shepherds feed themselves rather than the flock, therefore you shepherds hear the word of the Lord. This is what the Lord God says. Look, I am against the shepherds. I will demand my flock from them and prevent them from shepherding the flock. The shepherds will no longer feed themselves, for I will rescue my flock from their mouths so that they will not be food for them. This is what the Lord God says. See, I myself will search for the flock and look for them as a shepherd looks for his sheep on the day he is among his scattered flock. I will look for my flock. I will rescue them from all the places where they have been scattered on the day of clouds and total darkness. I will bring them up from out of the peoples, gather them from the countries and bring them to their own soil. I will shepherd them uh, on the mountain of Israel, in the ravines and in all the inhabited places. I will tend them in good pasture and their grazing place will be uh, on Israel's lofty mountains. There they will lie down in a good grazing place. They will feed in the rich pasture of the mountains of Israel. I will tend my flock and let them lie down. This is the declaration of the Lord God. I will seek the loss, bring back the strays, bandage the injured, strengthen the weak, but I will destroy the fat and the strong. I will shepherd them with justice. That is a powerful statement of God's opposition to the ones who should be the shepherds of Israel, who have fallen down on the job. And he declares that because they did not do what they were supposed to do, he himself would become the good shepherd. And that's exactly what our Lord has become you know the people were distressed and dejected and i think we have to think about that in today's terms how do you think people feel today do you think people with covid and all the rest that's going on all the issues in our country do you think they feel somewhat distressed and dejected or how many people do you think are feeling that way because the church has let them down 
Maybe through false teaching. Maybe through scandals in the church. Maybe they just were unwelcome. Or they felt judged when they came into the church building. How many people are feeling distressed and dejected because we haven't been the good shepherds? So when we see people on the street or at work or anywhere in the world, what's our first reaction? Is it to pass judgment on them or is it to have compassion for them? If you see a homeless person walking down the street, do you think to yourself, I wonder what it is that caused him to become homeless? I wonder what he did or maybe what his parents did. And it reminds me very much of when the disciples walked out of the temple and they saw the man who was born blind. And the disciples asked the very same question of Jesus. Lord, was it his sin or his parents' sin that caused him to be blind? And Jesus said, it was neither. He's blind so that God might be glorified in his healing. And he healed the man. But when we ask, is that person who's down on their luck, down on their luck because of something they did? We're putting the blame on them. That's not what they need. They need a helping hand. And we need to have the compassion of Christ for the lost. And so, when you look out at the world and you see the misery and suffering, I pray that you would have the compassion of Christ because apart from Christ, these people will all be lost. And that's why Jesus calls for workers. For workers for the field. And we come to the final verses here, 37 and 38. Then Jesus said to the disciples, the harvest is abundant, but the workers are few. Jesus says the harvest is abundant. There's crowds of people following him. At times, literally thousands of people. And here are Jesus and 12 disciples against a thousand people to be saved. That's a lot of work for just 12 guys, 13 people. And so he turns to them and says, look at this abundant harvest. All of these souls that need to hear the good news or might need to be healed or have demons cast out or whatever the cases may be. The harvest is abundant and there's so few of us. What does he tell them to do? Therefore, I always see those conjunctions. Therefore, connects the two verses. Pray to the Lord of the harvest to send out workers into the harvest. The first reaction is prayer. Pray to the Lord, the Lord of the harvest, Send out more workers. We need more workers, Lord. That's the solution to the problem. It's prayer. Now, people debate, what is that prayer really about? Is it a prayer that Jesus would send out the disciples? Pray to the Lord of the harvest that he would send out the workers? Or is it a prayer that the Lord would provide additional workers, new workers? And I tend to lean toward that side. You see, it's a principal lesson that I learned uh, when I went to a conference not long ago called the Cyprus Conference. It was about kingdom growth, kingdom growth. And that principle was the resources are in the mission field. Very often when we think about doing things, we think about the resources that we have within our own congregation. And we forget that the resources are actually in the mission field. Whenever we talk about doing something, very often I hear the same three questions. What's the liability? Where are we going to get the money? And where are we going to get the people to work? All right, Same three questions almost every time. And they're good questions to ask, but they're all internally focused questions. It's not counting on the Lord of the harvest to provide the workers. When I was uh, at the church where Christy and I got married, I was the financial secretary or treasurer, or whatever financial role they had given me, but I was the one who kept the books. And so I went to a conference on finances for the church. And in one of the discussion groups, one of the pastors got up from a, another church. It was a bunch of churches here. This pastor gets up and he was fairly cross. And he said, you know, my people are cheap. He said, they don't give. They don't tithe. You know, we need more money. We don't got it. And they're just not generous people. And a woman got up and said, I think you're wrong. I think your people are very generous. I think they give cheerfully. They just don't give to you. 
And she was absolutely right. It was an epiphany for me. It was a light bulb moment, whatever you want to call it. People will give to something they believe in. And they didn't believe in this pastor's vision or his mission. When we did the um, fundraiser for Cornelius Elementary, if you remember that a couple of years ago, we were going to, we planned to get gift cards for every classroom teacher at Cornelius Elementary. $250 gift cards. There were 32 or 34 classes. It was seven, over $7,000 or about $7,000 that we needed to raise. And, you know, we raised that whole $7,000. But the money didn't all come from here. About $800, I think, came from the church, which was great. But the other $6,000 plus came from out there came from the mission field. The resources are out there. All right, the people out there heard what we were doing and said, I like that. I want to support that. I'm going to give to that mission. And it was funded by the people outside the church. Now, it helped the church to build a relationship with the school, but we used the resources of the community to do it. Right? And, and that's what this idea is all about. The resources are out there. People don't want to give to the church. They want to give to a cause. And so what we have to do is better express and, and tell our story about the causes we're supporting. Because people will give to a cause they believe in. Why do you think people give to the ASPCA? Every time we get one of those little letters, right, when the little sick dog or whatever, or my wife sees it on TV, she's ready to write a check, right? People, yeah, people will give to a cause, not to an organization. And we need to bear that in mind. People will volunteer for a cause. All right? People will get behind the church and its activities. And then what happens? Then we start working side by side with the people in the community, many of whom may or may not know the Lord. And by having that relationship of working side by side on a mutual cause, then we develop a friendship and then we can say, hey, do you know what drives me to do this? Jesus' compassion for the lost. And then you can have that conversation. But we have to earn that conversation. God will provide all that we need. It's out there in the harvest field. We just need to change the way we look at missions from an internal focus to an out external focus for resources. We need to understand the resources are out there. And it begins with prayer to the Lord of the harvest. Lord, Bring those workers, bring those resources that we might do your work in the field. And then we go forward in faith. Go forward in faith that God will provide. And so my closing question for you is, are you ready to pray for the harvest and trust in the Lord that he'll provide all we need? And our call to action, as I said, every good sermon has a call to action. If you ever noticed in the bulletin, it will always say, Here's what I think you should do based on this sermon. Number one, continue. Continue in your mission despite opposition. Quitting is not an option. Have compassion for the lost. No judgment, just compassion. And then pray and trust the Lord to provide the workers for the harvest and all that we need to bring glory to Him. And all God's people said, Amen, Amen. At the ev end of every sermon, we do call for a decision. Right? Like I said earlier, Jesus was out preaching the good news of the kingdom. Preaching requires a response. The call to action is for those who are believers. I want you to do those things. Continue in your ministry. Have compassion for the lost. Pray that the Lord will send the workers and the resources. But if there's anyone out here today who doesn't have the Lord in their life, there's something you need to do first. Before you start doing those things, you need to come to the Lord. You need to give your life to Him in repentance and faith. You need to turn to Him and say, Lord, I can't continue on my own. I'm far from You. I feel that separation. But You designed me. You created me to be in a relationship with You, and my heart yearns for that relationship. So Lord, accept me now, and then lead me in Your ways that I might do what's pleasing to you. 
I might feel that love and compassion that you had so many thousand years ago. And then, Lord, let me go forward to tell the story of how you saved me, a sinner in need of salvation, a wretched person who was lost like a sheep without a shepherd. And then go forward and tell the message to someone else and rescue them. We were talking about this in, in the Wednesday Bible study too, about that old shampoo commercial where the one person said, I told two friends and they told two friends and so on and so on and so on. And as that exponentially exploded, same happens with the gospel. If we can just tell two people and then they tell two people and so on and so on, that message will explode. But it all begins first and foremost with you responding to the message. Hear the good news of Jesus Christ. You were created to be in a relationship with Him. You broke the relationship through your disobedience and sin. And there's nothing you can do to fix it on your own. And that's why He came. He came to live the life that you were supposed to live. And then to die the death that you deserve to die. And then He rose again so that if you just put your faith in Him, you too will rise with Him in glory. So put your faith in Jesus today. As I stand down here and await you, Terry will lead us in the invitational hymn. If there's anyone out there who has uh, anything they would like to pray with me, come down. If anyone out there wants to join the church, come forward and make that intention known. But first and foremost, it's always for those who would like to give their life to Christ today. In the book of 1 John, the Bible says... Whoever claims to live in him must walk as Jesus did. Let's stand as we sing hymn number 665. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee. Oh, Master, let me walk with thee in lowly past of service free. Tell me thy secret, help me bear the strain of toil, the bread of care. Help me the slow of heart to move by some clear word. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May he make his face to shine upon you. Go forward to have the compassion of Christ. Going and teaching and preaching and healing. And doing all these things to his glory. In the glory of Jesus we pray. Amen.